Welcome to another edition of The Left Hand Path. Here we discuss issues and topics relating to metaphysics, astrology and astrotheology. The word sinister comes from the Latin for left hand. With a basic understanding of Kabbalah and astrological principles, we can shed light on the occult forces underpinning the globalization project exposing its sinister progression towards the left-hand path. Although Jewish mysticism claimed that the origins of Kabbalah stem from Adam, Abraham and Moses, the truth is uncertain and its origins are unclear. It is likely that Kabbalah evolved from ancient pagan star worship, a form of astro-magic and was the result of our ancestors' understanding and interpretation of their conscious relationship to the Creator. Kabbalism is not a religion, but a way to comprehend our relationship with that Creator. It is possible that this profound ancient wisdom could have come from a sophisticated antediluvian civilization with a developed understanding of their relationship to the macrocosm. Many forms of occult knowledge have some connection to Kabbalah. It is a sophisticated, poetical, diagrammatic representation of how the Logos creator manifested aspects of divine consciousness here in the material realm. It also maps out our conscious relationship to the Creator within various levels of differentiating divine manifestation throughout all levels of this known physical reality. The diagrammatic Kabbalah represents the tree of knowledge or the tree of life, the same tree found in the Garden of Eden. Although the Bible mentions two trees in the garden, a tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in reality and in Kabbalism, the tree of life is the tree of the knowledge of good, whereas the tree of death is the knowledge of evil. While the tree of life offers pathways towards union with the Creator. The tree of death offers the opposite, a path away from divine consciousness towards spiritual emptiness, disunity and division, towards a material reality devoid of spiritual content and divine light a place sometimes referred to as hell. The basic concept of Kabbalah begins with divine consciousness deciding to have a physical experience within the constraints of this earthly realm's limitations of space and time. It is thought that divine light offering unlimited potential within the galactic center, filled a container with the Creator's consciousness. This vessel ultimately shattered under the pressure of divine brilliance, spreading small pieces of divinity throughout the galaxy. As the fragments of light traveled further away from the pleroma or galactic center, its density increased, allowing divine consciousness to manifest in physical form, creating various levels 
and dimensions of physical reality. As the shattered light entered our solar system, it differentiated, manifesting into pockets of cosmic consciousness, producing planets and luminaries of varying shapes and sizes. Eventually, here on Earth, numerous expressions of divine consciousness materialized in a variety of life forms, with the human genome being the closest of all life forms to the Creator. To understand Kabbalah's interpretation towards our relationship to the Creator, one must first accept that the Creator, Logos, is the unlimited potential of all possibility, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, a consciousness beyond our ability to comprehend, existing outside the physical constraints of space and time, a rigid paradigm which traps us in a progressive lineal approach to matter in this physical reality. According to Kabbalah, the Creator made the creature, man, with the intention of bestowing upon that creature all his wants, needs, and pleasures to enjoy. In a divinely created paradise of bliss and plenty. Made in the image of God, the creature was given full dominion over his environment, with free will to choose whether to ascend the tree of life in an attempt to seek union with his creator, or descend down the tree of death to become detached and alone in an empty husk-like reality, devoid of light, love and bounty offered by the Creator. Adam and Eve were told they could eat from any tree in the garden, but not from the tree of knowledge, which, in real terms, is the Kabbalistic tree of death. This is the left-hand path. Kabbalah expresses the nature of divine light as it diffuses and fragments its way through the solar system. It is the physics and metaphysics of the spiritual realm. As the divine light, consciousness, enters the solar system, it leaves in its wake ten energy centers known as Sephirot, with a number of conceptual connecting pathways as it descends into material form. The Sephirot represent the planets and luminaries orbiting the sun. In traditional Kabbalism, the objective of the creature was to receive all that the Creator wanted to bestow upon him. However, the only difference between a person who receives in abundance and those who do not is in the individual's willingness to receive. Based entirely on their perceived relationship with the Creator. As the creature matures, he finds a need coming from within to be like and know the Creator. However, in order to do this, he must learn how to bestow like the Creator instead of being one-dimensional and only experiencing reality as a receptive vessel. Becoming like the Creator was considered ascending the Tree of Life, a spiritual journey which brought one back in union 
with the Creator, essentially fulfilling man's ultimate destiny. Wherever a person finds themselves at any point in their lives, there are Kabbalistic pathways leading up the tree of life or down towards the tree of death. The choice is ultimately yours. We either take the righteous path, a spiritual journey towards union with the Creator, or we take the left-hand path towards a cold, lifeless world of godlessness, preoccupied by material matters alone. Religion assumes that the Creator changes his attitude to a person depending on that person's actions. The science of Kabbalah, however, states that the upper force is invariable and the actions of a person can in no way affect it. Instead, the person's actions can change himself. He will be able to perceive the upper governance differently if his own changes are aimed towards greater resemblance. He will be able to perceive the Creator as kind and good. By increasing the difference between his properties and those of the Creator, he will feel the Creator's attitude as more negative. Michael Leitman According to Kabbalah, if we are unable to feel the divine good emanating from the Creator, the problem lies with us and not the Creator, as the Creator is constant in His bestowal. The ultimate goal of Kabbalah is to develop a sixth sense, a second nature, opposing duality and division, all those aspects which are synonymous with the left-hand path and the tree of death. The term sixth sense is slightly misleading because we are not actually developing another sense but a new perception of reality, promoting the desire to see others as yourself and to understand the whole collective soul consciousness. With this approach, we develop a closeness with divine consciousness towards equilibrium of form, allowing us to perceive things we would not normally perceive, as though we are viewing the human experience through the eyes of the Creator. The only thing limiting a person in this earthly incarnation is their desire to receive. Correcting this perception is how we ascend the tree of life. We are all pieces of the initial soul, the Adam Harishan, created in the upper worlds. Our ultimate goal is to reunite with the Creator's consciousness from the divine light that shattered into millions of pieces, a light which we are all part of. The tree of death is a mirrored reflection of the tree of life, moving in the opposite direction and further away from the spiritual origins of life towards what some would call the pits of hell. A perception of reality full of division, disharmony, immorality, disunity and materialism. A place where black magic and demons run amok, pulling anyone who goes there away from their divine roots and into a downward spiral of negative emotions and emptiness. While the tree of life has many pathways with ten spiritual energy centers known as Sephirot, each assigned with angels guarding their spiritual dominion 
and place within the heavens. The tree of death has energy centers called Cliffoth. These Cliffoth come with an array of demons and dark entities eager to attach themselves to anyone's conscious perception in order to feed off their divine spark residing within, pulling them towards a miserable husk-like existence culminating in spiritual death. Each path between the ten Sephirot has different characteristics, depending on its position of the Tree of Life and the relevant Sephirot between those pathways. For example, from Malkuth at the bottom of the tree, in the earthly realm, the path towards Yesod, ruled by the moon, could be viewed as the first step into the world of the inner self and the spiritual subconscious, a righteous path which opens one's whole perception of life towards spirituality, moving one step closer to a conscious union with the Creator. Because Kabbalah is the esoteric foundation to many occult practices, it is no surprise to find that tarot cards fit neatly onto the ten sephirot and the numerous pathways leading to the top of the tree towards the crown of the supernal triad. Furthermore, each of the twenty-two pathways connecting the sephirot on the tree of life are given one of the twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John 1, 1 5. If we consider all the major religions in relation to their adopted planets and view them from their corresponding position on the tree of life, the tree's profound overall esoteric correlations begin to make a little more sense. From the first pathway, to the Sephirot Yesod, we develop a conscious connection with our inner subconscious mind. This first path towards spirituality tied to the moon can be seen in the everyday lives of monks. As they observe and adhere to the moon's phases and cycles, while learning the ancient art of meditation. From Yesod, the pathway to the Sephirot Hod, ruled by Mercury, is one in which the inner subconscious learns to communicate with the spiritual realm. Buddha, with one D, is Sanskrit for the planet Mercury. Consequently, Buddhism is very much tied into the Sephirot of Hod, which is the Mercurian energy vortex of communication. Once an individual has mastered the art of meditation, one can move up the tree of life by learning to communicate with their inner spiritual side, connecting them to the Creator. Hod is the Sephirot of splendor, which means magnificence, grandeur, opulence, luxury, riches, fineness, beauty and elegance, a word whose description accurately describes most traditional ornate Buddhist temples 
with their gold Buddha statues and elegant architecture. Hod is also the eighth Sephiroth. Could this be the real source behind the Buddhist's eightfold path? The next Sephiroth is Netzach, ruled by Venus, a planet synonymous with Islam. This Sephiroth is all about victory, a word used to describe the ambitions of faithful Muslims over non-believers or infidels. Netzach is the seventh Sephiroth, maybe the real reason why Muhammad celebrated his victory in Mecca by walking around the Kaaba seven times. The Quran refers to the concept of victory in numerous texts. Allah was much pleased with the believers when they swore fealty to you under the tree. He knew what was in their hearts, so he bestowed inner peace upon them and rewarded them with a victory near at hand. And another favour will he bestow, which ye do love, help from Allah and a speedy victory. So give the glad tidings to the believers. When there comes the help of Allah and victory. Quran Chesed is the Sephiroth ruled by Jupiter, the planet associated with Christianity. Chesed's energy vortex appears on the pillar of mercy, and being the Sephiroth of mercy, its influence can be seen throughout the Christian Bible and religious ideology. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Hebrews 4, 6 All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Psalms 25, 10 Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Luke six thirty six. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. Proverbs eleven seventeen. Judaism holds the highest position of all the monotheistic religions on the tree of life, being aligned with the Sephiroth Bina, an energy vortex ruled by Saturn. It is the closest religion to the Creator within what is referred to as the supernal triad. Could this be the reason why the Jews are referred to as God's chosen people? Bina is the Sephiroth of understanding, also associated with the color black. Coincidentally, those with knowledge and understanding graduate from years of study with squared black mortarboards and black gowns. Judaism is a religion which promotes scholarship and knowledge. This offers scholarly Jews a deep metaphysical understanding of their conscious relationship with the Creator. Human beings are human by virtue of our being in covenantal relationships with other human beings, with the earth and with God. And Torah is our evolving understanding of what that practically means. If Torah is our understanding of being in covenant, mitzvah is our acting out of being in covenant. Rabbi Brian Field There are three pillars to the tree of life which descend from the Creator at the crown. On the left side of the tree of life, ranging through Bina and Geburah to Hod, is the pillar of severity. 
incorporating the maleficent planets of Saturn and Mars. On the right side is the pillar of mercy, incorporating benefic planets like Jupiter and Venus. In the middle is the pillar of equilibrium. This is the easiest path to the Creator, which includes the Father, the Son, and the Moon, the Holy Spirit. When the Tree of Life is viewed from this perspective, it becomes a little clearer as to why various monotheistic religions align themselves to particular traditions. These traditions reflect behavioral patterns, ceremonies and beliefs, all of which try to promote spiritual ascension of the Tree of Life while at the same time restrict any subversive influence from demonic entities that frequent the tree of death's energy vortices known as Cliffoth. The pathway between the moon Sephirot, Yesod, and the sun Sephirot, Tifereth, is represented in tarot as the temperance card. Temperance definition, restraint or moderation, especially in not yielding to one's appetites or desires, abstinence from alcoholic drinks. As can be seen in this basic explanation of Kabbalah, all the virtues in life concerning one's behavior, temperament and outlook have the potential to lead a person up the righteous path on the tree of life towards union, while conversely all the vices will do the exact opposite and lead one further and further down the tree of death, away from the Creator's desire to bestow, which inevitably restricts a person's ability to receive divine light, resulting in the detachment of the spirit and the slow death of the soul. There are many opportunities in modern society which can lead someone down the tree of death. It is my opinion that over the past few decades, society has been purposely steered down this dark and sinister path by its ruling classes, many of whom are willfully ignorant as to what is unfolding. The reason for this is multifaceted and will be discussed in greater detail later. However, without realizing it, each new generation 
is becoming more materialistic and egocentric, drifting further away from a healthy, balanced spiritual attachment with their Creator. According to Jewish tradition, after Cain killed Abel, Adam separated from Eve for a period of 130 years. During this time, he was seduced by Lilith and Nama, producing many demonic children who went on to plague the future of mankind. These demonic entities could very well be connected to the archonic entourage of the Demiurge. Both Nama and Lilith can be found on the first path leading down the tree of death. Lilith is the mother of all demons, and both her and her sister Nama, the queen of the night, seduce all who enter and walk their first steps down the tree of death and into the abyss. The spirit of defilement comes from the corrupt serpent, which is Lilith. Lilith is a wicked bondwoman that is insolent, has no humility and no modesty, and she is the mother of a mixed multitude. Solomon refers to her when he said, A virtuous woman is a diadem to her husband, but she that acts shamefully is as rottenness in his bones. Furthermore, Lilith has neither humility nor modesty before God. Her children are similar, being a mixed multitude. In the future, God will remove her and her children from the world, for they are bastards, born of the nine attributes, as described by the sages, the nine attributes for which children are considered bastards by the Torah are a wife raped by her husband, a wife hated, a woman menstruating at the time of intercourse, a wife whose husband at the time of intercourse thought she was someone else or his other wife, a wife who is rebellious at the time of intercourse, a husband drunk at the time of intercourse, having intercourse with a wife divorced in her heart, a wife who is insolent, a wife who had relations immediately prior to her marriage. Samael and his female Lilith were servants to God, but later made themselves into deities. God will remove them out of the world and wipe them away. Lilith is called filthy refuse because she is excrement mixed with different types of filth and vermin into which dead dogs are buried. She is a grave of idolatry. She is the reason the dead dogs and vermin become a bad smell. Key tets Passage 39.113.123 Sexual desires within the tree of death can never be satisfied, as lust is loveless. This form of sex promotes greater promiscuity together with a greater desire for more deviant perversions. Only those who can control the cravings of the mind can raise their energetic serpent by conquering the dragon within and then to thereby transform themselves from intellectual animals to the greatest spiritual version of themselves. Desire is never satisfied by the enjoyment of the objects of desire. It grows from more to more, as does the fire to which fuel is added. Dada J. P. Vashwani There are many ways to seduce a person, setting in motion their descent down the tree of death, a journey which few recover from. 
as the path to the moon sephirot on the tree of life represents our vulnerable emotional subconscious it is also the key to the seduction of our emotions which can lead to our downfall it is therefore vitally important that the conscious mind steers the vulnerable subconscious away from corruption and temptation enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it matthew seven thirteen fourteen our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one the lord's prayer pornography freely available on the internet together with the establishment's sexualization of our children's minds imposed upon them by the modern schooling curriculum are both contributing to the undermining and deviation of society's morality and sexual behavior stimulating a variety of addictions and perversions which easily opens the door down the left-hand path as the anus is ruled by the base chakra which in turn is ruled by saturn it is therefore no coincidence to see the promotion of anal sex and sodomy throughout all levels of this globalization project Sandalphon, the archangel which guards the first path from the earthly realm to the moon Sephiroth, is one of a handful of archangels whose name does not end in L. Instead, it ends in Phon. Sandalphon is the archangel of music, ruling over all music in heaven. He also helps people on earth to communicate with the creator through music consequently spiritual music generally resonates at higher frequencies with the aim of uplifting the internal spirit towards greater union with the creator however when music is bastardized towards base frequencies which energize the soul or our base animal instincts those frequencies have the capacity to drive the subconscious down towards the tree of death music has been used for thousands of years to inspire and motivate people in various ways national anthems and patriotic music have the ability to resonate deep within the subconscious promoting significant emotional sensations today it is becoming clear to most people that the majority of modern music has changed not only in lyrical content but also in sophistication much of it has become repetitively simple lacking inspiration and the ability to uplift an individual spiritually modern music tends to promote themes of materialism sex and selfishness as though it is being influenced by the demonic duet lilith and nama the first cliffoth down the tree of death is nehemoth it is responsible for frightening sounds in strange places 
where beautiful music becomes perverted. The next cliff off, down the left-hand path, is Gamaliel, opposing the Sephirot Yesod, the foundation. This cliff off is responsible for the corruption of all forms of visual art. The Gamaliel are the mishappen and polluted images that produce vile results. Modern art, films and various forms of visual expression are becoming more satanic, expressing a more materialistic perspective as opposed to the spiritual. Visual stimulation in the form of art easily finds its way into the garden of the subconscious, influencing each generation's habitual nature through the corruption of their emotional coordinates. Still under the influence of Lilith, we see a great deal more sexualization and perverted distortions occurring in the modern film industry and art world in general. While Hod Splendor is the creator of form, its counterpart Samael is the desolation of God, where the nature of morality is perverted into a version of moral relativism, a place where common or traditional social morality is discarded in favour of one's own unique and distorted interpretation of acceptable morality. Samael and Lilith created a host of demon children, one being Asmodai, the sword of Samael. The Sephirot Netzat, Victory, is ruled by Venus, the planet associated with Islam. Here, in return for putting your faith in God, where the Creator bestows ample energy and strength in all your daily needs, the Cliffoth opposing Natzek is Arat Zarak, or Harab Serapel, with its demon Baal. Baal is the maker of sharp weapons, promoting violence in society. Furthermore, it helps to desensitize most people towards appalling acts of violence. Baal is also referred to as Lord of Darkness and linked to Tubal Cain mentioned in the Bible. Zilla also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Nama. Genesis 4.22 Ruling the sixth Sephirot, we find Archangel Michael presiding over Tifereth, the energy center of beauty. The opposite Cliffoth, Thagirion, is ugliness, the inversion of beauty. The demon ruling Thagirion is Belphegor, Lord of the Dead, and the chief demon of laziness. This Cliffoth promotes all things ugly, distorting society's traditional and acceptable norms concerning beauty. It is responsible for the change in social attitudes in areas such as body image acceptance, transgenderism, tattoos, vulgar body piercings, and ugly behavior in general. Gebera severity is associated with the planet Mars, a planet of proactive energy and movement in a specific direction, promotes power to rule in righteousness. The opposing cliff off, Golachab, is associated with the burning of bodies. Its demons and entities enforce their will upon others through brutal strength not righteousness. The assigned demon, Asmodeus, is attributed to one who is adorned with fire. In practical terms, this cliffoth 
will promote harsh laws on those who take the righteous path, corrupting those in power to abuse society in a ruthless, aggressive and inhumane manner. Asmodeus is the prince of the demons and one of the seven princes of hell. Each of these seven princes are said to represent the seven deadly sins and or vices associated with the traditional seven planets. Chesed Mercy is the Sephirot associated with Christianity. It promotes kindness and compassion through God's mercy. Ruled by Jupiter, it is the source of abundance, bounty and optimism. Its opposing Clifoth, Gar or Gamchikoth are known collectively as the devourers. They seek to waste the substance and thought of creation, while seducing men by means of laziness and self-doubt. Astaroth, the demon associated to this Clifoth, is the prince of accusers and inquisitors. From a social perspective, this Clifoth will eradicate inspiration, imagination and critical thinking, promoting uniformity and regimentation within society together with the inability to think outside the box. The Sephirot Bina, understanding, is ruled by Saturn, associated with the color black and the religion of Judaism. Its archangel is Tzapkiel. Bina is attributed to the divine feminine or the great mother of the cosmos, referred to as the eternal womb, which gives birth and shape to the infinite spirit of the Creator. Bina is one of three Sephirot within the supernal triad, together with Chokma and Keta. Bina's counterpart, or Clifoth, on the tree of death is Satariel, which is the domain of the demon Lucifuge, one who flees the light. In practical terms, this would manifest as an attempt to conceal the Creator by promoting atheism. The second Sephirot, Chokma, is ruled by Neptune, one of the outer planets associated with spiritual matters, dreams and illusions. Chokma is the Sephirot of Wisdom and the Divine Masculine, located at the top of the Pillar of Mercy. Its Archangel is Raziel, the Keeper of Secrets and the Angel of Mysteries. Chokma's counterpart on the Tree of Death is the Clifoth Gargiel, the Confusion of the Power of God a place empty of the Creator. Assigned to this Clifoth is Beelzebub, a demon with the ability to fly. Consequently, he was known as Lord of the Flyers or Lord of the Flies. In the New Testament, Jesus mentions the destructive power of division within the godless realms on the Tree of Death. Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do you people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Matthew 12, 25, 28 The crown or divine Sephirot, Keta, 
is the seat of the Creator, where all infinite potential or divine consciousness begins. Archangel Metatron, also known as Mitatrush in Islam, is the highest angel, serving the Creator as a celestial scribe. While the crown Sephirot is concerned with unity, within an all-encompassing oneness, within universal consciousness with the Creator, its counterpart, down the tree of death, is all about division, separation, duality, and godlessness. Because of its divisive nature, the Cliffoth Thaumiel, Division of that which is perfect in unity is ruled by two of the highest demons within the underworld, Satan and Moloch. In Hebrew, Satan is the genetic noun which means the accuser or adversary. Moloch, on the other hand, is an ancient Canaanite god associated with child sacrifice. Together, both Satan and Moloch are the apex of the demonic world, a materialistic world of divide and rule, where the divine spark within humanity is extinguished in favor of an inferior, artificially created divinity. Over the past 2,000 years, all the main monotheistic religions have tried to steer their followers on a path of righteousness, occasionally falling foul to the temptations and distorted divisions promoted by the left-hand path. Although Judaism, associated with the Sephirot Bina, was on the whole concerned with righteousness and union with the Creator, something changed during the 17th century, bringing forth a new interpretation of Kabbalistic teachings, a perspective which saw both good and evil as equal expressions of God. Through the Bina Sephirot on the Tree of Life and the Satherial Cliffoth on the Tree of Death, the new Kabbalists believed that a new Messiah could be encouraged to come forth into this earthly realm.
The Jewish Kabbalah purports to be a uniquely Jewish creation given to God's chosen people by Moses, Abraham and even Adam, resurrected from 2nd century Jewish law and compiled by rabbinic elders, bestowed by God as a means to communicate and unite with divine consciousness on a spiritual level. However, the truth of its origin appears to be slightly different. A more plausible explanation of its introduction comes during the Jewish spiritual renaissance of the 13th century. At a time when ancient manuscripts and writings were being translated by Muslim scholars during the Golden Age of Islam, an age which began in the 8th century and lasted up until the collapse of the Abbasid Caliphate due to Mongol invaders, culminating in the siege of Baghdad in 1258. During this time, the Muslims created the Great Library in Baghdad, bringing together some of the greatest written works throughout their empire and the known world. Great works from ancient Greece, Persia and India were translated into Arabic, creating a vast Athenium of ancient knowledge, works from some of the greatest minds in world history. At this time, both Jewish and Surfi thinkers laid the foundations for the emergence of Kabbalah. Though presented by the original authors as a series of venerable spiritual teachings ascribed to ancient Jewish masters of the early centuries of the Christian era, it was not. It bloomed into existence at the very time that it was claimed to be uncovered. And it was, of course, said to be wholly Jewish, employing the language and alleged tale, myth, law and symbolism of 2nd century Hebrew and Aramaic as an entrance into the mysteries of spiritual union with God. Tom Block, a question of Surfi influence on the early Kabbalah. At this time, Surfism was widespread throughout the Islamic empire, especially around the Mediterranean basin. Islamic mystics had already paved the way with their knowledge of astro-magic and ancient esoteric wisdom from which Kabbalah would eventually flow. It was no coincidence that the early Kabbalistic writings and the work of Surfi philosopher Ibn Arabi appeared around the same time, the late 12th and early 13th centuries. Jewish refugees from Muslim Spain were breathing new life into the doctrines and imagery developed by the Surfis in Baghdad and later in Andalusia, creating the new system of mysticism known as the Kabbalah. Michael McGar, Medieval Encounters 3 Jewish Kabbalah evolved from a collaboration of ideas, myths and writings which grew during this period. Writings such as Sefer Yetzira, Book of Creation, the earliest book on Jewish esotericism ascribed to the patriarch Abraham. Sefer Baher, Book of Bright, an anonymous early Jewish esoteric mystical work which led to Kabbalah. Sefer Halun, Book of Principles, a 15th century work outlining the principles of Judaism. The Zohar, Splendor or Radiance, a comprehensive work laying the foundations of Jewish Kabbalistic mysticism. The surfer Yetzira emerged during a wonderfully amicable time between the two biblical cousins, 
when Jews were included even in the highest intellectual circles of the Islamic Caliph's court in Baghdad. An Islamic text of virtually the same name, Secret of Creation, a book said to have been written during the time of the Caliph al Mamun, 813-833 predated the Sefer Yetzira by a century or so. Tom Bloch, a question of Surfi influence on the early Kabbalah. The technique of magical and mystical calligraphy current among Muslims around Damascus and Baghdad, beginning in the ninth century, found its way into Jewish mystical traditions in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries. This technique of mystical calligraphy in Islam was based on Surfi teachings on divine names. Ariel. According to Mark Verman, in his book, The Books of Contemplation, Medieval Jewish Mystical Sources, he suggests that the Zohar was written by the Spanish rabbi and Kabbalist known as Moses de Leon, 1240-1305. His conclusion is based on Leon's wife's own confession alluding to this. Many of the concepts found in Leon's Zohar mirror the works of the Spanish Surfi Muhammad ibn Masara, 883-931 whose work must have made some kind of influence over Moses de Leon. It is worth mentioning, at this stage, a prominent central figure in the development of Jewish Kabbalism, a man by the name of Moses ben Jacob Cordovero, 1522-1577. He was the leader of a mystical renaissance, of the 16th century, along with a mystical school in Safed, Ottoman Syria. He was also responsible for bringing different schools of thought on the subject of Kabbalah together to produce the first fully integrated interpretation of Kabbalism. Following on from Cordovero's work was none other than Isaac Luria, the father of Lurianic Kabbalism. The interesting thing here is Moses' surname, Cordovero, a name taken from the southern Spanish city of Cordoba, a city which was once at the forefront of progress and sophistication during the Golden Age of Islam, when Muslims were united and powerful. The name Cordovero indicates his family origins to the Spanish city, which most likely ended with their expulsion in 1492 as a result of the Spanish Inquisition. There are different ways to spell the word Kabbalah, depending upon which ideology is interpreting the system. Jewish Kabbalism is spelt with a K. Christian Kabbalah is spelt with a C, and Western Hermetic Kabbalism is spelt with a Q. It is not an exclusively Jewish discipline. How did this profound esoteric and occult discipline of trying to comprehend human spiritual connection to the Creator become perverted into a divisive, destructive form of black magic which, I suspect, is a major contributing factor leading society towards the left-hand path and down the tree of death. Lurianic Kabbalism was the underlining influence which spawned Sabbatai Zevi's interpretation of this ancient knowledge. To understand Zevi's perspective, further examination is necessary concerning the Sephirot Bina, a Sephirot ruled by Saturn, the planet adopted by Judaism. B. 
Bina is the third Sephirot within the supernal triad, considered to be the divine feminine, a power which presides over the seven lower Sephirot, and the source from which they emanate. Bina is the great revealing one, who bestows the structure of the Absolute onto the Created. The King Messiah is the secret of Bina, and when the time for the redemption of Israel will arrive, the Holy One, blessed be he, who is Keta, will cause him to smell all those fine smells and perfumes. That attribute, called Messiah, as it is written, and the spirit of Elohim is hovering over the face of the water. This is the spirit of the Messiah. Then the Bina, which is Messiah, judges the poor in the right manner, namely Knesset, Yisrael, because she arouses stern judgment and just unto the nations of the world. Saturn's Jews, page 59. Thus we find in the emphasis on the redemptive nature of the third Sephirai, designated as the Redeemer and Higher Messiah, a clear tendency to depict the return of the emanative process to the source, a restoration of the primordial, a circular concept of what I propose to call a cosmic macrochronos and not a historical rectilinear version of history which ends or culminates in the messianic era. Saturn's Jews, page 60. According to Judaic Kabbalism, Saturn, Bina and Redemption are related to one another. The name Sabbatai is Hebrew for the planet Saturn. His name literally meant the planet Saturn, and in Jewish tradition, the reign of Sabbatai, the highest planet, was often linked to the advent of the Messiah. And since it is higher than all the seven planets, it is appointed upon religions and buildings. And because the planet Sabbatai is appointed over the perpetuation, when it will arrive, to the ascent, it will not decline for ever, as it is said that the Spirit of God dwells upon him, the Spirit of Chokmah and of Bina. See and understand that this is the secret of Messiah Yahweh. This is the reason why every ascent of Israel is but by the means of commandments when they draw upon themselves the power of the Bina, see and understand that the planet Sabbatai has the crown of Bina. Joseph ben Sholom, Ashkenazi, 14th century Spanish Kabbalist. It is thought that Sabbatai Zevi was initially named Sabbatai because he was born on the Sabbath, Saturn's day. This was a custom at the time which possibly contributed and influenced his own beliefs seeing himself as the new Messiah, which ultimately led to his Kabbalist movement of Sabbateans, a movement which evolved from the foundations laid by the Lurianic Kabbalists. It is plausible to assume that because Jewish Kabbalists saw the third Sephirot as the seat of messianic power, which would initiate the manifestation process that Jesus, the ambassador of Christianity, aligned to the fourth Sephirot, Chesed, could not be their Messiah, and therefore rejected him. Coincidentally, it is worth pointing out that as Kabbalism is the foundation of many occult and esoteric practices, that the glyph for Jupiter, the crescent over the cross, is also a symbol used to represent the number four. 
while Jewish Kabbalists regarded Saturn and Bina as the divine feminine, the Messiah and the seat of divine manifestation, many Greek and Arab astrologers considered Saturn to be a maleficent and malignant planet, viewing those who worshipped it to be contaminated by its wicked nature. Since Saturn is the cause of sorcery and of pagan worship, our master Moses of blessed memory has to stand in the breach and guard Israel in the matter of the Torah and commandments which issue from the Sephirai of Teferet and from all kinds of pagan worship, all kinds of sorcery issue from Saturn. Rabbi Yehanan, Alemano, Heshek, Shlomo. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Revelations 2 9. It is well known in the science of the planets that when someone makes a peculiar image from a peculiar matter which is connected with a peculiar planet, as they, the ancestors, said, there is no leaf of grass on earth, etc., and he will place it under the power of the above-mentioned planet. When the latter is at its ascendant and in the house of its glory, then will the power of the star pour upon that image, and it, the image, will speak and perform certain operations, and they are the teraphim, which from Saturn to melancholy are mentioned in the book of the prophets. Likewise, when a person prepares himself for that, for example, to receive the power and the spiritual force, of the planet Saturn, he would dress in black, and he would wrap himself in black, and would cover the place he stood upon with black clothes, and would eat things which increase the dark bile, which are under the dominion of Saturn, and he should smell things that are attributed to it, and will compose of them a perfume to burn incense from the above-mentioned things, so that the incense would rise to heaven to the above-mentioned planet, and the light of another planet would not intercede. Then the power and the spiritual force of the above-mentioned planet will pour upon the person, and this is the essence of the prophecy of the Baal, and the prophets of Ashtoret and similar phenomena. Solomon Maimon, Jewish philosopher, late 18th century. According to Moshe Idol, in his book, Saturn's Jews, he points out that the majority of references made by Jews regarding the planet Saturn are almost all of a negative nature. This only changed after the 12th century when Saturn is referred to in a more positive light. I would like to emphasize that in the few cases of astrological discussions where Sabbatai is mentioned by Jewish authorities before the impact of Arabic astrology is discernible, all the descriptions of Saturn are negative. Positive qualities may be added to the negative ones only after the 12th century, and it seems to me that only this positive addition may explain the subsequent developments in Judaism insofar as Messianism is concerned. With this new Jewish renaissance in Kabbalistic matters, especially concerning redemption and the arrival of the long-awaited Messiah, Kabbalistic practices may have been seen in the same light 
as astro magic and black magic, giving rise to a link between some Jews, Saturn, Sabbatai, and the Sabbat of witches. Some ignorant Christians at that time, having no knowledge of Kabbalah, could have viewed anything they did not understand as a form of satanic ritual, which ultimately fell under the Catholic Church's laws concerning heresy. For the Catholic Church to come down so heavily on sorcery, black magic, astro magic, and particular interpretations of Kabbalism would seem to suggest that in certain hands and under certain circumstances these practices must have had some element of power which had the potential to undermine the church's own ambitions and authority. Witchcraft, especially Sabbath witches, would align their conscious attachment with the tree of death's demonic forces by conducting their rituals on Saturn's day, the Sabbath. Witching rituals usually take place from nightfall on Friday to nightfall on Saturday. Witches and Satanists from all over the world still to this day join together at numerous locations with the intention of summoning forth dark energies and entities associated with the left-hand path and the tree of death. It is generally understood that the Redemption and the Messiah would ascend from the third Sephirot Bina. It is also the belief of some Kabbalists that both the left and right-hand path originate from God. Therefore, a Messiah whether he comes from the third Sephiroth on the tree of life or the third Cliffoth on the tree of death, it is not important, because good and evil are just relative concepts. All that matters to some Kabbalists is that all the circumstances are in place for the new Messiah to appear. I will once again refer to the following quote from the Talmud, stating that a Messiah will come during a time when the people are either all good or all bad. In my opinion, elements of the new ruling classes are promoting the latter, because promoting moral degeneration runs in line with their divide and rule policy, a policy which has been underpinning the globalization project since its conception. R. Johannan said, When you see a generation ever dwindling, hope for him, the Messiah, as it is written, and the afflicted people thou wilt save. R. Johannan said, When thou seest a generation overwhelmed by many troubles, as by a river, await him, as it is written, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him, which is followed by, and the Redeemer shall come to Zion. R. Johannan also said, the son of David will come only in a generation that is either altogether righteous or altogether wicked. In a generation that is altogether righteous, as it is written, thy people also shall be all righteous, they shall inherit the land for ever, or altogether wicked, as it is written. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor, and it is elsewhere written, for mine own sake, even for mine own sake will I do it. Talmud, Sanhedrin, 98a
What is it about the Holy Land which makes it so holy? Maybe there is a link between the ancient esoteric wisdom contained in Kabbalah and land considered holy to Jews, Muslims and Christians alike. There are a few clues within both Kabbalah and some old written descriptions concerning this matter. It is possible that during the early development of Kabbalah, a physical geographical area of land was adopted to represent Kabbalistic metaphysical components, incorporating Jerusalem as the supernal triad or Godhead. Leading from Keta, the crown Sephiroth is one of the longest pathways between Sephiroths, known as Gimel, a Hebrew word which means camel. This path from the divine spirit of Keta to the sole son of the sixth Sephiroth, Tifereth, terminates in the middle Medi of the tree of life. Could this be the true origins behind the name of the city Medina? Before the 20th century, the only practical way to travel from Jerusalem to Medina was by camel, across what was referred to as an abyss, an inhospitable and barren desert region which made for a long, arduous and sometimes dangerous journey between the two cities. This part of the Kabbalah tree is also referred to as the Abyss. South of Medina is Mecca, an ancient trading city and the home of the Kaaba. When Muhammad took over the city with his Muslim army, he threw out 360 idols in favor of a meteorite which possibly fell to earth from Venus as it changed orbit many years ago. Before this, Muhammad circulated the Kaaba seven times. Why seven? Was he paying homage to the seven lower Sephiroth before dedicating the Kaaba solely to the worship of Venus and the seventh Sephiroth, Netzach? the Sephiroth of Victory. Continuing south, there is a city called Sana, a female name meaning to shine or glow. Could this represent Yesod, the Sephiroth ruled by the moon? At the lowest point in the southwest corner of Arabia, we find the city Aden, a Somalian word for Adam who represents the earthly kingdom of Malkuth. The Sumerio-Akkadian name for Jerusalem, Urusalam, means foundation of the god Shalem. All in all, this is more than just a remarkable coincidence. At the end of the 13th century, the medieval Kabbalist Abraham ben Samuel Abulafia, another character, who believed he was not only a prophet, but also the Messiah, wrote about the land of Israel together with references to Saturn, texts which, I presume, were written after the last of the Christian Crusades around the time of the siege of Acre in 1291. The land of Israel is higher than all the lands. The known land whose sign is 1,290. And this is the land of Israel, which was the land of Canaan. And it is known that among the stars, the power of Sabbatai corresponds to it, because it is the highest among its companions. And behold the supernal entity appointed upon another supernal entity and the nation of Israel is superior to all the nations. For there is one on high who watches over him that is high, and that there are yet higher ones. And the high is the dust of the land of Israel, 
and higher than it, which is appointed on it, is Sabbatai, and Israel are higher than them. Abram ben Samuel Abulafia. The pathway between the crown Sephirot, Ketha, and Bina, the messianic Sephirot, is known as Beth. It is described as the first action in the creation process, the beginning of duality, where the creator initiates the created. Coincidentally, the place of birth of Jesus, the Messiah of the Piscean Age, was Bethlehem, only nine kilometers south-southwest of Jerusalem. Is it the case that our Kabbalistic ancestors throughout the Middle East saw Israel and the Hejaz, the west coast of Saudi Arabia, as the physical earthly expression of the Tree of Life, with the Red Sea separating it from Egypt? And is it the case that the Hebrews regarded Egypt as the physical manifestation of the tree of death? The fact that the name Suez is Zeus, Jupiter, spelt backwards, could give some credence to this proposal. When revisiting the story of Exodus, where Moses parted the Red Sea, saving the Israelites, from the Egyptians, it could, in this context, be considered as a metaphorical explanation for a person's journey back up the tree of life after seemingly becoming trapped down among the archons and demigods associated with the tree of death. In the Red Sea Crossing, a passage in Exodus 14 mentions a character called Baal Zephon. Furthermore, the Exodus story mentions 42 stations or locations visited by the Israelites as they made their way towards Israel and the Holy Land. There are 22 pathways on each tree and if the earthly pathway is not included and counted twice, then we have all the pathways from hell at the bottom of the tree of death to the creator at the top of the tree of life. Bearing in mind that Mars is the planet of proactive energy and physical movement in a specific direction, Moses could very well be the personification of the planet Mars. No tree, it is said, can grow to heaven unless its roots reach down to hell. Carl Jung The name Red Sea also has a metaphysical significance, which could represent a metaphorical crossing from one tree to another, a symbolic barrier. Red is the colour synonymous with seduction, the underworld, and objects moving away from one another as in the Doppler shift. In this case, it is the created creature moving away from the Creator. Is it the case that thousands of years ago, the Demiurge and its demonic creations ruled parts of the ancient world, a world of megaliths, giants and various godlike entities requiring human obedience? respect and sacrifice, a pantheon of idols and gods who, through either a cosmic cataclysm or divine intervention, were washed away in a great global catastrophe. Some artifacts and megalithic remnants of this once powerful civilization still remain, paying homage to the Demiurge, the gods who once walked amongst men, masters of an extremely advanced materialistic civilization.
once monotheism in all its forms evolved, utilizing the knowledge of Kabbalah, humanity found a way to escape the bondage and desolation found within the tree of death. By understanding their relationship to the Creator, through the use of Kabbalah, they were able to free themselves by crossing the Red Sea and ascending up the Tree of Life towards a more righteous and optimistic path. If there is any credence in this idea, it means that the ancient knowledge of Kabbalism has been around for thousands of years, giving Muhammad his unique perspective on how to unify his people and promote them up the righteous tree. If the Holy Land and the Hejaz represent the tree of life and the path to spiritual enlightenment, then we can assume Egypt, the land west of the Red Sea, to be an area associated with the tree of death, its cliffhoths, and all those pathways which lead to the demiurge. Egypt in Arabic is Mizza, meaning country with government, laws and order. The Quran also refers to Egypt as Mizza, the country with government. Mizraim is an old name for Egypt, and being the son of Ham and grandson of Noah, Mizraim's offspring led to the Hamite branch of Noah's descendants. The name Egypt also comes from the Greek Aegyptus, which is the Greek way of pronouncing Hutkarpatar, a name which means Temple of the Soul of Patar. According to some scholars, Patar was the ancient Egyptian demiurge of Memphis the god of both craftsmen and architects. In the triad of Memphis, the old capital of Lower Egypt, Ptah was the husband of Sekhemet and the father of Nephratum. This triad is similar to the supernal triad at the top of the Tree of Life, but this path leads to the rulers of the Tree of Death, down into the arms of the Demiurge, via Satan and Moloch. The ancient Egyptians used the name Kemet as the name of their country. This translates as black country, with the people referring to themselves as Remech and Kemet, meaning people of the black country. Although orthodox historians regard the term black as a reference to the colour of the soil on either side of the Nile. Could it be that the true meaning behind black country is really a reference to the dark satanic side of esoteric mysticism and the tree of death? Although Egyptian society lasted thousands of years, it eventually degenerated through the abuse of black magic with the pharaohs becoming tyrannical over their subjects. Around 700 BC, when the city of Memphis became the administrative capital of a united Egypt, a text known as the Memphis creation myth was written. In this myth, it states that Ptah, who was regarded as the god of the earth, created nine other deities referred to as Ennead. This is quite astonishing when considering there are ten Cliffoth within the Tree of Death. Consequently, is it possible that Ptah and his Ennead are the Egyptian equivalent of the ten Cliffoth associated with the Tree of Death? Once the Israelites had crossed the Red Sea, they were made to wander the wastelands of the desert for forty years, until those who had done evil things had died. The Lord's anger burned against Israel, 
and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years, until the whole generation of those who had done evil in his sight were gone. Numbers 32.13 In traditional Judaism, it was customary to only allow men over the age of forty to study Kabbalah. The reason being is that in order to fully appreciate its esoteric wisdom, only the mature mind of the forty-year-old was capable of comprehending it. Sabbatai Zevi declared himself Messiah at the age of forty. For the Sabbateans, forty was a very significant age, the age of true maturity. And a man of forty is ready for Bina, understanding. Avot 5.24 Sabbatai Zevi went too far. He took a group of disciples into the mountains and attempted to command the sun to halt. For a day they prayed, with Sabbatai Zevi confidently announcing that the sun would respond to his commands. This blasphemy earned him the censor of the local religious court. Sabbatai responded by declaring himself superior to the court and excommunicating them. This impudent response earned him excommunication and banishment from Smyrna. Other contemporaries recount that Sabbatai aroused the ire of the Smyrna community by proclaiming himself a prophet, and that it was this that led to his excommunication and banishment. Paul Benjamin on Sabbatai Zevi After his banishment from Smyrna, he made his way to Salonika in Greece, another hub of Kabbalistic learning. In the beginning, he assimilated, fitting in well with the other rabbis and the community as a whole. However, after some time, his mental illness erupted, unveiling his maniac and eccentric nature. His mania soon returned, and with it his transgressions of the law. Once more he pronounced the divine name. Further, he staged an elaborate wedding ceremony and banquet, to which he invited all of the leading rabbis of the city, wherein he married a Torah scroll. This ceremony appears to have had a profound personal impact on Sabbatai Zevi. For the rest of his life, he spoke of the Torah as a bride and himself as its bridegroom. Once again, Sabbatai's odd behavior was deemed as too transgressive to allow him to remain, and he was banished from Salonika sometime before 1658. Paul Benjamin on Sabbatai Zevi From Salonika, he spent some time in Greece before making his way to Constantinople. As before, he was accepted as a normal member of the Jewish community until he purchased a large fish, dressed it up like a baby and placed it in a cradle. To Savatai Zebi, this act symbolized the new Messiah in the age of Pisces. The rabbis of Constantinople were not impressed. They ordered him to be flogged along with a modest period of excommunication. During his time on the move, it is suspected that he had visions which told him to violate normal Jewish law, concluding that such violations were necessary and sacred. His reason for doing this was to collect any divine spark encased in sin which had found its way into the husk-like shells of the cliffoth down the tree of death, and it was the duty of the Jews to redeem the spark from their material prisons and bring them back 
towards holiness. In Zevi's view, the only way to redeem the world was to sin in an attempt at acquiring all those imprisoned divine sparks. He believed his task as Messiah was to transcend all earthly boundaries by operating in an entirely new way. His followers saw his conversion to Islam as a necessary way of freeing the divine spark trapped within the religion. Upon Sabbatai Zevi's death, his brother-in-law, Jacob Selebi, took over the role of leading the Dogma. Not only was he a close friend to Sabbatai Zevi, but he was specifically selected by Zevi to become his successor. The wife of Sabbatai Zevi and sister to Jacob Seleb testified that her brother underwent a three-day transformation where the spirit of Sabbatai Zevi had entered into him in a process of spiritual rebirth, essentially becoming the new Messiah. Gradually cracks began to appear in his authority and capability to lead the Dhamma as a unified group. Because he offered a pragmatic style of leadership promoting assimilation within the Islamic Ottoman culture, he was regarded by some followers as too much in favour of Islamic principles putting the teachings of Sabbatai Zevi in second place. With the initiative of Mustafa Selebi, another leading light, the Donma split, with a new group adopting a boy named Osman Baba as their replacement messiah. This new group, known as the Caracas, believed that the spirit of Sabbatai Zevi had reincarnated within the boy, thus giving him divine powers. While the Yakubi were assimilating successfully within Islamic culture, spreading out from Salonika and dressing accordingly, the Caracas kept their own identity, staying true to the legacy of Sabbatai Zevi. They had more in common with the Surfi orders of Islam, forming close ties as they existed in a more underground fashion. When Osman Baba was 40 years old, he was officially declared as the new messiah. Tension began to mount within the ranks of the Caracas, as some of its top leaders did not regard Osman Baba as Sabbatai Zevi's replacement. And when Baba died, a few years after his 40th birthday, another split occurred, promoted by Ibrahim Agha. Believing Baba to be the Messiah, the Caracas didn't think his body would decay like an ordinary man. Consequently, Ibrahim Agha and his followers wanted Baba's body unearthed to see if it had rotted. If so, they would be vindicated in their belief that he could not be the Messiah. After much infighting and disagreement, the body was finally exhumed only to discover that it had rotted, just like every other corpse in the cemetery. In the mind of Ibrahim Agha and his followers, it was clear indication that Osman Baba was no messiah. Consequently, they split with the Caracas, forming yet another group of Donma, known as the Kapansi. Both the Caracas and the Kapansi believed and promoted the doctrine of Torah of emanation part of the teachings of Sabbatai Zevi, in which all prohibitions of the Torah were reversed into commandments to commit acts of sin, all in an attempt 
to repatriate fragments of divine sparks concealed within the cliff off down within the tree of death it is likely that this doctrine lay behind the promotion of perverted sexual acts wife swapping orgies and incest it is also suspected as being one of the factors together with sabotai zevi's bipolar personality which led to his bizarre sometimes outrageous behaviour the donma believed that only through the act of sinning could the world be truly elevated finally fulfilling god's ultimate plan jacob frank another leading figure in the sabbatean kabbalistic movement converted to islam in order to become a member of the caracas movement frank was another charismatic leader who considered himself to be the spiritual reincarnation of sabbatai zevi and consequently another messiah when he and many of his followers found themselves excommunicated from mainstream traditional judaism they moved to europe to claim leadership of the polish contingent of the sabbateans once in poland the frankists converted to catholicism becoming a form of christian donma frank also promoted his daughter eve as their sect's version of mary the holy mother on frank's death eve took over the sect however producing no children of her own left the sect with no successor and so it began to fizzle out eventually dissolving by the late nineteenth century the kapansi differed slightly from the other groups in the way in which they chose their leadership instead of looking for a physical or spiritual replacement for sabbatai zevi they chose to focus their movement's leadership and structure based entirely on the teachings and wisdom left by sabbatai zevi this gave an element of stability to the group preventing future charismatic leaders from undermining the core teachings of their messiah this approach produced a sect which was relatively successful within the host country allowing broad and extensive trade to prosper as they dealt with all sides as the kapansi climbed the economic ladder along with their merchants and professionals they became part of the upper and middle classes the yakubi were also successful due to their ability to assimilate with the broader ottoman society because the caracas relied on the personality of their leader the reincarnation of sabbatai zevi and the messiah they were open to deviations brought about by their leader's unique personality and interpretation of sabbatai zevi's teachings this is partly why the frankist movement was regarded as an extreme and perverted cult of sabbatean judaism a movement rejected by rabbis within the council of four lands and the majority of jews faithful to the torah and traditional judaic laws this culminated in claims of incest blasphemy heresy and an overall attempt to invert and pervert judaism in 1759 this ultimately led to 2000 frankists within the city of lvov being excommunicated by the moderate mainstream jewish community of the time this policy of excommunication put a great deal of pressure on those within the frankist movement the ban included the following statement we shall not rent a house to or from them we shall not buy from them or sell to them 
we shall not teach their children, nor bury them, nor circumcise them. Council of Forelands ban on the Frankists. This added pressure contributed to Jacob Frank's decision to convert over to Catholicism, persuading thousands of his followers who later followed suit. Publicly, they would appear to be Catholics, but privately, many of them despised the church and continued to practice and promote their extreme version of Sabbatean mysticism. As part of the conversion process, they were asked to declare the Talmud as nonsensical and a pack of lies, while still maintaining their recognition for the Zohar. They also had to admit that their fellow Jews did indeed use the blood of Christian children to make matzot, unleavened bread for the Passover. Jacob Frank once addressed his followers with the words, I came not to elevate your spirits, but to humiliate you to the bottom of the abyss, where you can get no lower, and where no man can raise you by his own forces, but only God can pull him with his mighty hand from the depth. Furthermore, the Sabbateans in their pursuit of sinning would bless one another with the perverted verse, Blessed art thou, Lord, who cancels and allows the prohibitions. Although mainstream rabbinical authorities were essentially at war with the Frankist movement throughout the 18th century, Sabbatean and Frankist groups continued to spring up growing all over Eastern Europe and the Middle East. In 1760, Jacob Frank was arrested and charged with feigning conversion of Catholicism, together with the spreading of pernicious heresy. After being found guilty by the church, he was sentenced to 13 years in prison, which, over the years, increased his mystical qualities and popularity, ultimately elevating him to the status of martyr. Following his release, in 1772, he moved to Morovia, where he lived until 1786. From Morovia, he moved to Offenbach, a town on the outskirts of Frankfurt, here he was given the title of Baron of Offenbach. Now a wealthy nobleman, he lived a comfortable retirement on frequent donations given to him by his many followers. Here he stayed until his death in 1791, upon which his daughter took over the running of the Frankist movement. The important and interesting thing to note here, which will be explained in the following chapters, is that Frankfurt was also the home of the Rothschild banking dynasty, and Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Bavarian Illuminati, who coincidentally also happened to be a descendant of Jewish converts to Christianity. For the sparks of the holy, which are scattered among all peoples, must be brought home if everything is to return to its proper place and the redemption thereby be complete. Gershom Shkalem, the Messianic Idea in Judaism, and other essays on Jewish spirituality.